One of the first things new archaeology students have to get used to in field work is the extraordinary amount of record keeping. Archaeology is more than digging. In fact, digging is a relatively small part of what we do in the field. We spend more of our time writing and drawing what we find. One of the more difficult and confusing parts of this record keeping process is coordinates. They show up on sketch maps in our field notes, as isolated numbers in a flow of text, and even on finished maps used in publications. The flow of numbers, seemingly almost random to the untrained eye, can be a little confusing. Why do we do this, spend so much time crunching numbers and attaching them to artifacts? Well, in archaeology, perhaps counterintuitively, the most important thing is not the artifact itself, but rather where it came from. When you see this photograph, you probably immediately identify it as a classroom. But why? You see desks lined up in neat rows and all pointing the same way, a chalkboard in the background, and very little decoration otherwise. Past experience has taught you that those items in that spatial arrangement are found in classrooms. It's the spatial relationships that identify the classroom, not the artifacts themselves. After all, chalkboards are found in places other than classrooms, and desks, even this kind of desk, are too. Furthermore, items found in proximity to one another are used together. This desk was found with an apple and several books. It's reasonable to assume that the apple and books are used by individuals who sit at the desk. This chair also has an apple and several books. Whoever sits in this chair probably uses these books, not the books under the other desk. Along the same lines, we might reasonably conclude that an apple and several books are part of the toolkit used by students in the classroom. Again, the spatial relationships of the artifacts allow us to understand the actions of the people we're investigating. But archaeologists make most of our interpretations in the lab, not in the field. We remove the artifacts from their original contexts and return them to the laboratory. In the process, those spatial relationships are destroyed. Which of these apples were used by the person who sat at the desk, and which belonged to the person in the chair? Which of these books went with which apple? The only way to retain that information is to record the original location of each artifact, and then keep that information attached to the artifact itself. Then we can know later that these artifacts came from desk 1, and these came from desk 2. This is why we use coordinates in archaeology, to record spatial relationships in a manner that won't be lost when the artifacts are moved back to the lab. These coordinates are what we call provenience, the single most important bit of information about an artifact, sometimes even more important than what it is, is its provenience. So all archaeologists need some way to record provenience systematically. Coordinates are nothing more than a way to assign numbers to a particular location in space. But there are a variety of ways that we can do that. The most familiar are Cartesian coordinates. This system chooses a location arbitrarily, then extends two perpendicular axes from that point. Points in space are given coordinates according to their distance along each axis. So for Cartesian coordinates, you need to specify three bits of information. The origin point, the direction of one axis, well, the other axis is automatically perpendicular to it, and the unit of measurement. Then any point on that two-dimensional surface can be assigned two numbers, say, two and three, and its location will be fixed. Another coordinate system that is less familiar is polar coordinates. This also arbitrarily chooses an origin point and the direction of a single axis, but uses two units of measurement. In this system, there is only one axis. Points are identified by an angle away from that axis and a radius from the origin. The two units are a unit of angle, degrees or radians for example, and a unit of length for the radius. Both Cartesian and polar coordinates are intended to describe locations on a two-dimensional plane, but archaeological sites are on the surface of the Earth, which is roughly spherical. Geographic coordinate systems are designed to describe locations on the two-dimensional surface of a sphere. 
The most familiar of these is the latitude-longitude system. This system specifies various angles related to the geometry of the sphere and certain arbitrarily chosen points. In a mathematical sense, this makes some sense for archaeology. But the fact is that most archaeology sites are small enough that we can treat them as planar rather than spherical. So archaeologists use the much more intuitive Cartesian coordinate system. By convention, we use meters for the unit. Also by convention, the first axis points north. Why? Because Cartesian coordinates are suspiciously similar to the Mercator projection used in most maps. And by convention, north is at the top of those maps. Humans naturally like to start at the top. So we specify our axes according to which points up. If this is our Cartesian coordinate system, these are the map directions. We have the directions and units by convention. All that remains is to specify an origin point, 0, 0. This is specified differently for each site, with the convenient permanent landmark chosen so that future researchers can relocate particular spots. So for any given site, the only real question is, which landmark do we choose? And this is where another aspect of human nature comes into play. Humans find it much easier to deal with positive numbers than negative. 2, 3 makes a lot more sense to us intuitively than negative 3, 1 or negative 1.5, negative 2.5. Of course, in practice, the location wouldn't be called negative 3 meters east, but 3 meters west. But that change from east to west units has just as much potential to cause confusion. Ideally, we'd want our coordinates to be all positive and to use only two directions which means we'd want our site to be wholly in a single quadrant. To make our maps appear similar to other drawn charts and graphs, we usually choose the upper right quadrant. So when we look for a zero, zero point, we look for one south and west of the site, rather than in the middle of it. Let's say an archaeologist finds an artifact. The first step in recording its provenience is to set up the site grid that is, the origin point and the axes. He can then measure from the zero meters north line, the east pointing axis, to the center of the artifact and find out that it is three meters north. Measuring east from the zero meters east line, that is, the north pointing axis, to the center of the artifact, he sees that it is two meters east. The artifact's coordinates become three north by two east. Note that in mathematics, the horizontal x-coordinate is specified first, but in archaeology, the north coordinate comes first, even though it is vertical on the map. The same process can be used to identify excavation units. First, set up the grid, then measure, and record the coordinates of the unit. At this point, you might ask, why use the center point for artifacts but the southwest corner for units? With artifacts, we want to know their location, and the center point is the best way to give that location with a single number. But units aren't particularly interesting in and of themselves. Their only real significance is that they contain artifacts. If this is our 1 meter by 1 meter excavation unit with the coordinates specified for the southwest corner, a bit of easy math gives us the coordinates of each of the other corners. When we find an artifact in this unit, we need to measure its coordinates relative to the unit. For those measurements, we use the southwest corner as 0, 0, for the same reasons we placed our site grid's origin in the southwest. The artifact's coordinates are thus 0 0.5 meters north by 0 0.25 meters east. But that's not interesting, because it's relative only to this unit, not the whole site and the whole site is what we're studying. We can convert that unit measurement to a site-wide one with just some simple math. Add the unit coordinates to the artifact coordinates. All measurements within a unit are made from the southwest corner for this reason, to simplify the math necessary to convert coordinates. Another reason for preferring the southwest corner of a unit lies in how we measure those distances. Excavation units are always measured in one manner or another from the site zero, 0 point, which may be hundreds of meters away. We use high precision surveying equipment, but we also use much less precise tools like measuring tapes. 
whatever method used to measure those distances. The farther the point is from zero, zero, the greater the margin of error there is in the final results. If we record the unit coordinates by a corner of the unit, we have four candidates. Since we want to minimize error, we want the corner that is closest to zero, zero. The corner closest to zero, zero is invariably the southwest corner. Measuring the coordinates of artifacts within the unit from that corner will minimize the error when those coordinates are converted to site-wide numbers. Of course, that's only true so long as we're using north and east as our directions. If, for some reason, you have to put the origin to the north and east of the site, you'd want to measure to the northeast corner. But that only becomes an issue in rare circumstances. Archaeological coordinate systems are a combination of convention and necessity, but for the most part they are quite logical, and the conventions have evolved over time to make the task of recording proveniences as simple and error-free as possible. A bit of thought and careful mental math is enough to make sense of what might otherwise be a baffling jumble of numbers.